Okay. So some of these problems are going to lead to a larger discussion about the idea behind them, obviously. All of these problems are things that you've seen before. Now, I know for some of us, maybe it's been a while. For some of us, it didn't really make much sense the first time around, maybe. So let's look at um, what we had. Let's look at each one of them, but you guys tell me which one had the most trouble. Which one on here do you guys think was the hardest? There we go. 1A? Yeah. Oh, you're all like, I think equally they were all okay. I can't choose. It's like choosing which kid I... Okay. So, what would you do with this? Let's start off with a nice example. Square. Mm -hmm. Do what? I don't understand. So, multiply it by top and bottom by the x. Good. Multiply top and bottom by rad x. Right? So you have 3 rad x over x. Right? So with your trigonometry and all that kind of stuff, you should be very used to having like 3 over rad 2, and then you multiply top bottom by rad 2. Rationalize the denominator. Right? Uh, what if I had this, though? You multiply it by the conjugate? Conjugate. I love it. The thing that's got both of them in there, because a rad 2 by itself won't kill the rad 5. A rad 5 by itself won't kill the rad 2. You somehow need both of them. And the difference of squares pair is what makes sense. So here I multiply rad 2 plus rad 5. Rad 2 plus rad 5. Because the one place that a rad can still be alive is in the middle term. So if I do it so that the middle terms cancel, still rad. Right. So... You foil us out. What do I multiply this sucker by, then? X minus one. So square root of x minus one plus one. Yeah, square root of x minus one plus one. The conjugate of that thing. Does this sound at all familiar? All right. So on the top, to be honest, just leave it like this. We'll, we'll be used to this here in a bit. Don't multiply that out, so that doesn't help us out. Look what happens on the bottom, though. What's rad x minus 1 times rad x minus 1? X minus 1, because a radical is a one-half power, so a half of it times a half of it is a whole it. Oh. So that times that is x minus 1. The middle term cancels like we made it happen, so the radicals go away. Negative 1 times positive 1 is minus 1. And then look what happens. He's going, right? So that's the expression. That's what it is. Now, now we're going to deal with these things directly. And the way we're going to deal with them is related to what I'm about to ask you. What happens when you try to plug a 2 in for x? When you plug a 2 in for x, what, what happens? Zero where? On the top and the bottom. What is zero divided by anything? Zero. What is anything divided by zero? Infinity or, or undefined, right? So what the hell would zero over zero freaking be? It's like an unstoppable force, immovable object. Spin. But, so I can't plug a two in it. It's something worse than undefined. It's something called indeterminate, which is something we're going to discuss a lot later this semester. So what the hell? But can I put a 2 in what we just got at the end? Can I? Can I plug a 2 in to this? Yeah, so 2 minus 1 is 1 square root of 1 is 1 plus 1 is 2. So when I plug a 2 in, I get 2. But when I plug a 2 into this, it's indeterminate. So by doing what we did, we removed the... Look here. There's the problem, isn't it? Isn't that why it was 0 over 0 at 2? So, but when am I allowed to do this for every value except 2? Because 0 divided by 0 is indeterminate. I can't, I can't work with it. So we're going to get deeper into this. This is going to involve something called limits. So depending on your pre-calc teacher, they could have introduced the idea of limits when you talk about asymptotes. The limit as x gets really big would be related to horizontal asymptotes. No, yes, maybe so, a little bit. Okay. 
this is the kind of algebra we have to be able to do to analyze some of these limits we're going to have to be able to take. Um, this guy makes me a little sad when, I mean, on one level I understand it. We're not as used to logarithms as we are to radicals, for example, right? So if I said, if I said what's the cube root of 27, what would you say? Three. Three. Why? Because what is this question? What is the question that the symbol represents? What do I raise to this power to get this? Mm -hmm. Right? What's the cube root of eight? Why? Because 2 to the third power is 8. Right? I guess. Okay. All a logarithm is interested in is what power does it take to put on the base to become the thing on the inside. So, for example, log base 2 of 16, what power does 2 need to become 16? 4. So it's related to radicals. But with radicals, it's the base I don't know. Cube root is what do I cube to get this? I don't know the base. Logarithms, I know the base. The base is freaking two. I don't know the power. Do you guys see how they're related? So when, it, when you first are taught logarithms, very often the teacher will say things like, it's related to radicals. It kind of acts a little bit like radicals. But it isn't radicals, right? You've got to be really careful. They have a lot of distinctions. Um, now watch this, watch this. What's log base 2 of 4? 2. What's log base 2 of 2? 1. What's log base 2 of 1? 0. I like it. 2 to the 0 power is 1. And then log base 2 of 1 half? What do you need to 2 to make it become 1 half? Raise it to a negative power. Good. Negative 1. So log base 2 of anything between 2 and 1 would have to be a number between 0 and 1. It'd have to be a root. I want this understood. If it's below 1, it's a negative power because I've got to flip it. So the log base 8 of 2 is going to be some, involving some kind of a radical, which is what kind of a power? Fractional power. Right? So the answer to this is going to be some kind of fractional power. What root do you take of 8 to make it become 2? Cube root. So the answer is one third. You need to cube root the eight, which is you need to put a one third power on the eight to make it become two. So a logarithm's question is, what power does this base need to become the inside? Radicals are freaking easy to us because we've, been, we've internalized the question. We've used them a lot. So we really know what the question is. Logarithm's relatively new to us. So we haven't really fully internalized the question it's asking. We have to always ask ourselves the question until it gets in our head. You guys see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A little bit? <coughs> so this will be one third. Because eight to the one third equals two. I know, please don't take this personal if you made a mistake on this one. But it does make me cry a little bit when I get a lot of people, especially in even higher levels, that just takes the square root makes this 2x plus 8 or something. If that's what you did, that is really wrong. Uh, and the reason is, what, what what is a plus b cubed? Is that a cubed plus b cubed? You wish, right? You have to write it three times and foil it and bullshit, right? You guys with me? Why is it so hard? And when what's this? What's 3 times a plus b? What's that? 3 plus 3b. So it kind of sets you up to go, well, this should be just as easy. No, why would I expect that? What are coefficients based on addition? What does 3 something mean? That thing added to itself that many times, right? So therefore, coefficients are going to play well with addition and subtraction. What are exponents based on? Multiplication. They are not going to play well with addition and subtraction because they're freaking based on multiplication. Now, if that would have been a, b, q, like this, that would have been easy as shit. Because that's multiplication on the inside. So exponents are based on that. So they're going to play well with this. A cube, B cube. Now that looks more like that. These are both types of distribution here, right? The thing that's based on this operation will distribute nicely. The thing that's based on this operation will distribute nicely, period. This is a combination of shit. It's not going to be so nice. And roots are powers. Therefore, roots are not going to distribute. So, for example, 
square root of 4 plus 9 is not 2 plus 3? Of course it ain't, because then the square root of 13 would be 5. What? All right, I guess semi with me? So this is not 2x plus 8 or something. The only thing you can do with this is simplify the radical, which is the uh, factor of the inside. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of x squared plus 16, I don't know. Done. But that's one of the quickest ways to make your math teacher cry. I just want to get that out of the way now. You can make a mistake on that now, never you. It's going to make a lot of the work easier if you make that mistake, but it's going to be so wrong. Okay, okay, I like it. What about this little dude here? Yeah, no, 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 no. So the middle dude, so, so basically, this guy's got everything he needs. This guy needs all of that on the top and bottom. And this guy needs X. X. Now, the minute you get all the denominators the same, you kill them. It's an equation. I can multiply both sides by it. Now, that's assuming that X does not equal what or what? What can X not equal? What can x not equal? Four or zero, right? Either one of those is going to make it undefined. So assuming that's true, that it's not zero or four, I can then multiply by x squared minus four x both sides and kill all that shit. And then I have a much better looking thing to work with, right? Fifteen minus two x squared plus eight x equals x. So two x squared minus seven x minus fifteen equals zero getting it all together, making the x squared term positive, of course, to make it a lot easier. Is that decent? This right here has got to be your bread and butter. This has got to be like, oh, Jeff, please give me these kind of problems. No, this is old news for us, but it could show up in some problems for us in like the fifth step down or something. And then here I just have to... I've used quadratic formula, okay. You ain't gotta do that shit, this is factorable. 13 times 2, what Yep, you can do twice, negative 15, get negative 30. Factor negative 30 and make negative 7. It could be better than that though at this stage, right? Can't we? 2x squared, it could only be 2x and x, right? 15 could be 5 and 3, or 15 and 1, but. 5 and 3 would make 10, and 3 makes 7 if I make the right signs. Now, now, if you don't like what I just tried to tell you, how does this problem work for going twice? Negative 15 is negative 30. Does that sound familiar? It's like what people call master product or the AC method. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how to interpret the looks of things. Um, let's look at this directly. Somewhere in your life, you've had to factor this kind of thing. Hopefully, it, it, it's reminded. I've got to take 2 into account. So 2 times negative 15 is negative 30. Factors of negative 30 that make negative 7. Negative times 3. And then I can split the middle term up using those. This is one way to do this, if you want to. Does that sound at all familiar? Depending on your teacher, they could have showed you different methods. You could do the play around with the factors and see if they could come out right method, which is called trial and error. This is what's called, uh, when I was taught this, it's called the surefire method. Because if it's factorable, the surefire is going to work. So you take a 2x out, you take a 3 out, so you get 2x plus 3 x plus 5, so you get your x is negative 3 halves, and 5. So if you did quadratic formula, you should have gotten those. You should not have had to do quadratic formula, though. Okay. Cool. 
Yes, no, maybe so. So I, I kind of live off of questions and, dear God, don't just accept what I say. If you have a different method you like to use, if you're not sure what I did, speak up. This is awesome. Right? I know I don't want to play poker with most of you guys. So like, don't show them anything. Okay. So this problem, this next problem, I always, when I teach this, I say it's sort of like being a tyrant of a small country. Or a, a big country like America, I don't know. Uh, and if you have a radical element, you want to isolate it and then kill it, right? Because you're the tyrant in this country, are you with me? Now this is obviously math class, not that, this is just silly. But you, you don't want to square both sides right now, that would so desperately suck. You'd have to foil that side with a radical, the radical doesn't go away, that's just silly. But it doesn't make sense, I want to square this thing, obviously. But you want to get the radical by itself, so when you square it, the radical's dead. So of course the very first thing you want to do is add the two. And now if I square it, the radical actually is gone, which is the worst part of this problem. And I just have to remember how to deal with this. Yeah, get everything on one side, get it equal to zero. When you have a higher power on your x, you want to get it equal to zero. So you get zero equals x squared minus 5x. So you get x is zero or five. Now what's the last step in any radical equation problem? And, and why should I have to check these? Why is math giving me an answer that doesn't work? We did something that allowed for more answers. When I squared, in fact, look, one answer I got was zero, right? Before I squared, what kind of number was this? Zero minus one. If x is zero, that's a negative number. Square root equals a negative. No, right? But did we know that until we got down to here? No, so this is math's only way of communicating with us. Hey, <laughs> you did something weird up here. So I gotta check the zero work in the in the equation. No, it doesn't make it true. Why? Because we lost information here about whether this was negative or positive when we squared it. That's the trade-off. Sure, squaring is awesome because a radical, but it widens the possibility of answers, and some of them could be wrong. So we gotta check whenever you have radical equations. So zero does not work. Five does when you plug it. Don't plug it in like here. Never. You always got to plug it in the very original because the first thing you did could have been wrong. So you always plug it in the very original. Okay. So normally when I teach, do you guys know what Math 178 is? It's like watered down calculus basically. It's calculus for business. It goes straight to applications, very really little theory. Too bad for you. We're going to go through a lot of theory. Um, the thing that kills them and also kills people in 180 is not being able to factor, right? So this 3A, believe it or not, will happen a lot to us in our calculus work. We're going to get to a step where I have to be able to factor this. All 3A is, what method of factoring do we use? What, is, what type of factoring is this? How many terms are there? One, two. Mm. One, two. There's two terms, because terms are separated by pluses and minuses. So I just, I'm looking for GCF. What do they both have? So what number do they both have? Three. How many M's do they both have? One. How many n minus fives do they both have? Three. Three. And then I just write what's left. Six divided by three. Two. I had two n's that took one. I had three n minus fives that took all of them. All. Minus. Minus. Twenty-one divided by three. 
seven. I took that M away. And I only took three of these, so there's one left. 2M minus 7M is negative 5M. Negative 7 to negative 5 is plus 35. So what's the very last thing I can do? What's the very last thing I can do? Take out a negative 5. You can take out a 5 too, but take out a negative 5. Because that'll make the M minus 7. Now that form is much more useful because what kind of came out of here that I couldn't see in the beginning? You could tell that m equals 0 made the whole thing 0. You can actually tell that m equals 5 made the whole thing 0. Well, what else makes the whole thing 0? Frickin' 7. I would have never guessed that. Shit. <coughs> and my zeros are so important. The, the main thing we're going to learn in calculus, the main first idea, there's really just two ideas. It's a lot of little sub-ideas, though. There's two main ideas in calculus. The slope of something that's not straight. What's going to have to happen for the slope of something that's not straight? The slope of a line is easy, because once you know it, it's always the same. It's always going the same direction, the same amount. The minute I let it turn, the slope is then going to be different at every freaking point. That sounds like it's going to be impossible, but... We're going to develop a way to make a very quick, it's going to, the slope is going to be dependent on x. Depending on where I am, the slope is going to be different. Are you guys kind of with me? So, for example, uh, if I look at a parabola, what's the slope here? What's something you can tell me about, just tell me something about the slope there. Positive. So I'm going up the roller coaster, right? Mm -hmm. And over here, the slope is? That's crazy. Right here, the slope is? Zero. Because I'm not going up or down at that instant, right? So somehow, we've got to develop a way to figure out the slope at a point. What's weird about that? In algebra, we learn that to get a slope, I need to have two points. Shit. <laughs> so what's one way to get around that? Start with two points, but then let them be really, really, really close. And that's the idea of limit. Letting something get really close to something else, but never quite being there. That's the first big idea we really learned to get into derivative, get into the slope, is the limit of something. So this, why would this be important if this was not a roller coaster? This was a profit function. Why would that point that I'm pointing to be important? That is where you make the most money, right? So you'd be very interested in saying, at first finding where that is, and then saying, how do we get there, right? <clears throat> a friend of mine is a financial analyst, and basically that's a big chunk of his job, is to analyze demand and so forth and set prices so that they'll kind of get towards their maximum profit. So every day, things are changing, so the equation changes a little bit based on what's changed. So he's got to kind of recalculate where the, where the thing is. When is it time to change the price? What does he predict is going to happen? You guys kind of with me a little bit? Yeah. <coughs> so the study of how things change as you move is so fundamental. To be honest, calculus is where math starts. I don't tell people that until you're in calculus. Oh, I love the look I'm getting. You're like, I did a lot of math. What the shit are you talking about, Jeff? Once you've done calculus, if you go much further in math, you're like, how did I do shit before I knew calculus? So everything up to this point has really just been getting ready to learn calculus. This is the beginning. Now, a lot of us, a lot of you guys probably might not only need up to calc 2. You might just need calc 1 plus something else. I don't know. But calculus is so fundamental. It's just like, but you need everything you've done so far to get here. Um, okay, so what's it got to do with this? Well, if this was the slope function, then I can tell where the zeros happen if I'm able to factor the thing. So a zero happens at 5, it happens at 7. 
So this could be related to what price to set or how many thousands of things to try to sell or whatever the equation is set up to be. You guys with okay. Alright, so what about this guy? This guy is a little more traditional math 110 kind of a problem. What do you do first with this guy? How though? Yeah. Yeah, so GCF. And then you're like, what? 64. Twenty-seven. W. Q. If you stop there, you're not quite right because that can go further. Yeah. And this, of course, is uh, probably the most hated form of factoring is cubes, or little cubes, because it's the one you have to basically memorize the pattern of. Something like uh, what are these are something like squares. Like, how would I factor x squared minus forty-nine? Why is that so easy? Yeah, you just cut everything in half, plus minus, because basically you need factors that multiply 49 and add to be zero, because there's zero middle term. So of course they have to be the same, which means the number has to be a square. So you're just cutting everything in half. What's wrong with that related to this? How many do I have of everything now? Three. Three, because what's 64? What times itself? Three times. So 64b cubed is 4b, 4b, 4b. 27w cubed is 3w, 3w, 3w. So when I teach difference in sum of cubes, I teach little dude, big dude. And somehow I relate it to Pulp Fiction, that scene where they had to have the cleanup guy, the wolf, come in. Have you guys seen Pulp Fiction? I know it's an older movie. It's not black and white. I'm going to be shit. Uh, so it's out there. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's really interesting. It makes you question yourself about what you're laughing about. Yeah. Uh, so this, real, this scene is a good example where they shoot some guy's head off in the back seat and they have to have somebody clean it up. Right? So I call this the, the cleanup dude. Okay. So it's, it's related, very intimately related to squares, but I've just got three of everything. So I put a little dude, big dude. If I put one 4B, and one 3w in here, and I use the same sign, I've got to put the other two 4b's and the other two 3w's in there. Right, so then I get my 64b cubed, right? And I also get my negative 27w cubed. But I get freaking negative 48wb squared. Do I want that? No. And I also get freaking 36 B, W squared, I don't want that shit. So the middle guy is the cleanup guy. So it's cubes, one of each, two of each. And the cleanup guy is always the product of what's in here. So this, in this case, it will be 12 B, W. So he's the guy that if I multiply all that shit out, it's gonna cancel those other terms we didn't want. He's the cleanup guy, that's why it's always the opposite sum. Does that sound familiar? Okay, okay, good, good. And of course, don't forget you too, I'll just gotta come for the ride. What about, oh yeah, oh yeah. Hope, hopefully you had a trig teacher or pre-calc teacher with a trig in there that forced you to figure out a way to memorize some key trig functions of angles. I didn't memorize any tangents, I just make them as I need them, right? And then of course the reciprocal I didn't you just reciprocate, it's amazing. Um, have you guys ever seen, there's a couple of things I do. Um, I think I already talked to you about cosine as an asshole, that kind of thing, right? Um, but there's also, there's just certain things you can do with your knuckles, I think, or whatever it is, I can't remember. But for example, I wish to God, and, and if you love Sukkotoa, you're gonna hate what I'm about to say, I wish to God they never taught that bullshit. It, it, it would take you so much further if you were taught from the beginning that sine likes y, cosine likes x. 
So the closer you are to the x-axis, the bigger cosine is, because it's getting closer to where it likes it, right? Cosine is sort of a percentage, not really, but give me a break. Sort of a percentage of the thing that's along the x-axis, right? It's the shadow, all that kind of business. So if I'm at zero, what's cosine? One, it's all x. Is it where it likes it? Cosine likes x. Yes. So it's going to be the biggest it can be. I think I like a turtle putting its neck all the way. It's like it feels good. If it's at 90 degrees, it's going to be in. Doesn't like it. It's going to be zero out. Right. And what? So what sine is zero? Zero. There's no y piece here if I'm on the x-axis. And then now watch. This is kind of nifty. Let me look at sine specifically. So I'm going to say this in a weird kind of a way. This is square root of 0 over 2. Isn't that 0? Right? And then at 30 degrees, or pi over 6, what's sine? Careful. It barely grows. It's 0 here. It's going to barely grow to be a half, which is square root of 1 over 2. Stay with me now. I'm trying to show you a little pattern here. Some of you guys are seeing where this is going. What about at 45, pi over 4? Root 2 over 2. Yeah, it's root 2 over 2. At 60 or pi over 3, it's, it's root three over two. sine of pi over 3, root 3 over 2. And so here it's going to be one. root 4 over 2, which is 2 over 2, which is 1. Root 0 over 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, holy shit. That's beautiful. That captures the idea of sine growing as you go from 0 to 90 or 5 or 2. Cosine shrinking by the same amount. Are you guys? Uh -huh. So the idea that sine likes y, cosine likes x, if they taught it that way from the beginning, never brought Sokotoa in. If you love Sokotoa, you've got to realize you could do all the same shit without it. Totally. In fact, the more we do that kind of thing, the more it seems like it needs to be done. Like, I need Sokotoa or else this shit would be impossible. No, it's not true. It's so not true. You understand what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Does that make sense? So if you don't have it memorized, I personally don't have it, like, memorized. I don't. I think very quickly, sign, I'm close to zero, it's going to be smaller. The closer I am to y, the 90, it's going to be bigger. Root 3 over 2 versus 1 half, right? Those options. Are you guys kind of with me here a little, a little tiny bit? Okay. And of course, then is sine is y, so it's going to be positive here. And, you know, that, that kind of shit. Who cares? you got the numbers. You just put the plus and minus in depending on where you are. So, um, oh, those of you at home, you missed all that. It's too bad. I've got to hire somebody for that. So this guy, what I mean about reference angle work is just where, what, where do you end up? What quadrant do you end up in? Yeah. And you went how much past there? You went? Yeah. By every one sixth of a pi past the full pi. Right? And of course, sine, when you're close to the x axis like that, it's going to be big or small? Small. And of course, it's going to be negative. So negative one half. What about this guy? Where do you end up? Here. Quadrant? Two. Because negative 180 would be here. And how much more do you go past that? 45, right? Isn't this negative 180? Yeah. And then 45 more to make it negative 225. So I'm in quadrant two. And then know the reference angle because of that whole how much more did I go? That's the reference angle part. I know it's a 45 degree reference angle. Tangents at 45s are easy. It's either going to be 1 or negative 1. Because it's sine over cosine. And of course, that's right where sine and cosine agree. In this case, which one is going to be 1 or negative 1? Negative 1. Yeah, because they have different signs, S I G N, in quadrant 2. Okay, caps. So it's not, if you make everything pure memorization, you cannot make it very far in math. No. You desperately want to make it more Why does it make sense. And then you don't memorize it, you just know it, because it makes sense. This is how people manage to get very far through math. Um, oh, yeah. I like this. 
Now, I, I, I didn't say this, but hopefully you understand. If you printed out that post, that, that trig number, ex, uh, the expectation stuff, it says on there, these are the things we want you to know. This is related to... Is that one? Because it's cosine of x squared minus cosine Plus. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So I didn't make it that easy. If I would have put a plus in the middle, this would have been one. I, did, I made it a minus. So like, damn. So what is the hell is this related to? Cosine squared minus sine squared of the same angle. Yeah, double angle. So this equals cosine of twice this, which is going to be 5 pi over 6, which is one you could do. So cosine, we're using the fact that cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta equals cosine twice theta. What's the one, what's sine twice theta? That's the, there's only one option for that, sine twice theta. Anybody remember what that is? Sine of two theta? Two sine theta cosine theta. Don't mind us the plot, it's just one big term. Two sine theta cosine theta. Another one you gotta know. And what, how do I get, cosine of five pi over six is gonna be pi over six short of that. Close to the x-axis, it's going to be negative or positive. Because mm -hmm. cosine like x, that's where x is negative, so it's going to be negative. We're at 3 over 2, it's going to be the bigger one because it's closer to the x-axis. And cosine like x. The light. Anybody try? All right, before I do the bonus, any, any any questions about any of these that we've done today? We've done a lot. Anybody try the, the bonus one? What'd you get? Did I try the bonus one? Oh. No. Um, if you don't remember how this works, it could be a little strange, but what, what, what does an inverse cosine mean? If I have the inverse cosine of something, what is, what is the answer physically? Say again? Under one? No. Contra. Like, is it a line? Is it a plane? Is it a point? Is it a uh, ray? Is it, what is it physically? Angle, yes. The answer to an inverse cosine is an angle because the input for an inverse cosine is the output for the cosine and vice versa, right? So the input for an inverse cosine is going to be, or I'm sorry, the output for an inverse cosine is going to be the input for the cosine. It's an angle. So if I say cosine inverse of uh, one half, then what you're thinking is what angle do I take a cosine of to get one half? No, it'd be pi over three. Cosine smaller when you're further away from the x-axis, so you've got the bigger angle pi over three. How are we doing there? Now, if you if you don't have that immediate translation, you had that pi over three is sixty. You need to get there very quickly. And of course, pi is how many degrees? Equivalent to how many degrees? Pi is equivalent to how many degrees? 180. 180. So of course pi over 3 is 60. It's 180 divided by 3. What to do? Right? Um, okay. So if that's true, the answer to this is an angle. Right? Now how is that going to help me? Okay. So if I look at this problem, this is the cosecant of some angle. The cosine inverse of 2 over x. This is some angle. Now watch, this is kind of cool. The minute I do this, hopefully a few of you guys will remember doing this in pre-cal. Um, so if I say the cosine inverse is some angle, I can then take the cosine of both sides. And what's going to happen then? If I take the cosine of both sides, what's going to happen? What happens here? Inverse functions kill each other. So I get 2 over x equals cosine theta. Now, some of you guys are going to look at that and go, yay, Jeff, good way to go. 
another thing that I know shit about. It. But what's cosine? Isn't it define a triangle with its angle and the base? And what's the two and what's the x? Cosine, the fundamental idea of cosine. Trig functions are always ratios of triangles, always. Ratios of sides of triangles. So where's the two? On the bottom. And where's the x? I love it. Yes, sir? Uh, what does it say if you write it to over x? Is that negative cosine here? So here I had um, cosine inverse of uh, 2 over x. Is that a negative or, or a theta? What, what, all right. So here's what I had, right? Yeah. And then it's a cosine of both sides. Okay. So these kill each other, so then I got 2 over x. Cosine is like inside of the equal side. I got you. No way. You guys see that? Anytime you have a statement like sine theta equals square root of x minus 2, it sets up a triangle. You can set up a representative triangle for that. Trig for that trig function. And then you can use identities or you can use other definitions. Now, now what can I use? I, I want to know the cosecant of this, right? The question is, what's the cosecant of that angle? Well, what am I missing to figure out the cosecant? Am I missing out anything? Cosecant is related to sine. Sine needs the y piece. I don't have the y piece. But I can just use the Pythagorean theorem, which will tell me this is x squared minus 4. Good, square root of x squared minus 4. And then the cosecant is what sine would be flipped. So sine would be this over this, so cosecant is this over that. Does any of that sound familiar? I mean, you, you desperately should have done that in pre calculus. Students don't understand what I tell you. If you're really, really sure you've never done that, you should go back to your pre calculus teacher and slap him in the face and say, what the hell? Pre-calculus. Get me ready for calculus. You didn't do that? Arr. They should have done this sometime. Okay. So anytime you have an inverse trig function, you can actually set up a representative triangle and then answer whatever the hell question they ask you about it. That's awesome. Um, so what I need you guys to do by tomorrow is to try to do the first homework assignment, right? That's the one from chapter one, the review section. Uh, you need to come in tomorrow with questions. I want to devote the first chunk of class to just going over whatever questions you have from that assignment. Does that make sense? Cool. I like it. Okay. And if I don't get a lot of questions, I'll just talk about a few things and then go from there. Um, what was the... I'm just going to do one thing. No, it's okay. No, I'll wait for that. Okay. okay. Uh, so I want to come back to what I was talking about earlier. I... I kind of do things in a slightly different order than the book. I like to do them in the order where they make the more sense. Um, so we're getting into chapter two a little bit now. We're going to sort of do two, two, come back to two, one. They all kind of bleed together anyway. Um, Slope of a line. How'd you figure out the slope of a line if you had a couple points? What was the equation for the slope of a line? Otherwise known as m. Anybody know what the m is for? Where do they get m from slope? You're like, I don't see any m anywhere in this word. What the hell, man? Call it L, that would have been better. Line, you know? Yes, I like it. And uh, the French word for walk was marche, like march, right? So like, let's make it all big French. I have no idea. I'm not sure why B is the y-intercept. I don't know if they ever knew, to be honest. But what is the formula for slope? 
y2 minus y1 over all right, so let's make this a little more uh, formal. Let's formalize this a bit. What do we mean by that? So given y equal to a function of x, we're going to kind of try to expand this idea. So now our function could be doing whatever it wants to be doing. Yeah. And I want to know the slope at a point. Let's call it, and this of course is f of x. Okay. Let's call this x1, y1, just to be more specific. I want to know what the slope is at that point. Now the problem we had earlier was the fact that uh, I'm trying to build this off of algebra, which is what we're going to do, but it requires an extra idea on top of it. Because I can't do the slope at a point, because the fundamental formula for it requires two points. So what I do then, there's two kind of main ways to do this. What I do is I start at a point I use this point and one that's close to this point. So something like x1 plus h. And that's going to be y2 equals f of x1 plus h. So I want the slope at x1, y1. I can't get that. What I can do is try to make something that kind of gives me a good approximation. So I can go a little bit away from the point. How far away from the point? H away from the input, right? Well, and of course, this distance depends on what this function is. But okay. So now, I haven't really changed too much, to be honest. I, can, I could have used a straight line for this, but now I can rewrite that using the notation I've got here. So now I know the slope of f of x between uh, x1, y1. Oh, let's say x1, f of x1, and x, it's not x2, x1 plus h, f of x1 plus h. Oh, shit. So remember, the f of x is just y. This equals f of x1 plus h minus f of x1 over x1 plus h minus x1. Now notice something very interesting, of course. This is not a big surprise. On the bottom, it just becomes... The bottom just becomes h. Right, because it's all about how far apart the two points are, and in this direction they are h apart. I define them to be h apart. Okay. So that's what the slope formula looks like in calculus. Okay. Uh, and then the thing I want now, how do I, 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 could, I could actually make this a point. If this was negative 2, I could make this negative 1.5, meaning h is 0.5, it's 0.5 away. Are you guys kind of with me? Is that slope going to be exactly the slope I want? No, but it's going to be decent approximation. Here's the slope that I actually want is this here, and if I use this, it's going to be this. Now that, on my picture, looks crappy as shit, but... The closer I get to the actual point, the more precise it becomes until I'm actually right on the point. Well, the problem with that is I don't have two points anymore. That's where the, the, the formula would freak out. All right, you guys, this is the fundamental idea that built a lot of, of the, the, uh, the things we use for calculus. Right? So the next level of what I want to do with this is to let h go to what? What's going to make these, this point become closer and closer to that point is if I let h go to 0. If I let the separation between those two go to 0. 
Do I ever want them to actually equal zero? I don't want that separation to equal zero because then I got one point and then I, got, I don't have anything to work with. I like it. So the idea of a limit is what's it look like it's going to do? It doesn't get there, but what's it look like it's going to do as it gets closer and closer and closer? So I, I like to start here because this is the very first idea of calculus is just, okay, a line has a slope that's always the same. What do you do? I want to know what the slope is for this roller coaster looking thing. Which means the slope is it's going to be a function itself. It's not going to be constant. It's going to be a function. It's going to be different based on where you are. I like it. Now, now let, me, let me show you the other form of this, and then I'm going to take a step back and talk about the idea of limit by itself. And then we have to merge these two ideas. Okay. Um, the other way this could look, it's just a slightly different way of, of doing this. I'm going to erase all this here. Anybody in the front row notices this sucker, he's about to take a break.